uh, good evening, everybody. I and I know I am really the last person to stand here and speak to you. Um, thank you for staying this far, and I hope uh, the previous sessions were, you know, informative, uh, challenging. I was speaking to some students. They said they, it was just way above what they had uh, expected it to be, and that's the way you learn new things. If it if it was on par, that means you're not learning anything new. So you are the right place to figure out something new. So <clears throat> my topic, uh, as you can see quite clearly, is uh, it says uh, what's going on in a FOSS project. So let me introduce myself. My name is Harish. Um, I have been with Red Hat uh, almost 13 years, and I'm based out of the Red Hat Singapore office. Um, and currently, uh, for the last uh, few years, I've been um, with a group within the uh, Red Hat, uh, as it turns out, within the Red Hat legal team, for better or worse, called the Community Architecture and Leadership Team. So um, uh, it's, got, it's got nothing to do with legal. Okay, it's an it's a anomaly, but nonetheless, I think uh, it, it helps me uh, to do some of the things that I would like to be able to achieve. And one of those things is what I'm going to be talking about. All right, you are here and you have been wondering about open source projects. I think one of the biggest challenges all of us have is when you hear about a project, oh, there is this fantastic new project happening, or there's this project that's been going on for X number of years, or there is this other new thing that has just got forked from a previous project. How would you know anything about a project? When you fall sick, what do you do? Some of us may have to go visit a doctor. And what does a doctor do? Take some vital measurements. Like what? Blood pressure maybe, your you know, uh, uh, sugar level perhaps, uh, and so on and so forth. So you take body measurements related to the health of the organism, which is in this case you. What is the equivalent of that for an open source project? Okay. So, open source projects, as you can read very clearly there, okay, open source creates, you know, many, many solutions to all kinds of problems. That's why we, we like to solve problems because there is an issue, I need to fix this issue, and it gets fixed. And after fixing it, and I'm sure you have, some of you have heard of the phrase, scratch your own itch, which is really the motivation for a lot of software development. Apart from commercially paid for software development, largely commercial de I mean, software development is to solve a problem that you have. And because you can code, in the case of a software developer, you fix it. After you have fixed it, what do you want to do with the code? Perhaps you just abandon it. Perhaps it becomes part of something else. We don't know. But nonetheless, what we have seen in the last 20, 25 years of software development on the internet, okay, is that people solve problems and create interesting projects as a result of solving problems. So therefore, there are just thousands of them. And that's great. It is the Darwinian principle acting out in real life. And it's extremely, extremely powerful. So we have a very large number of projects. It creates significant economic value. And I, I, I mean, I don't want to harp on Red Hat as, a, as an example, but it's a convenient example for me to choose. Red Hat's economic value to our customers from a Red Hat perspective is the fact that we are able to bring, Red Hat is able to bring technology to commercially paying customers. The technology is 100% open source stuff that they can then benefit and increase their business efficiencies and whatever else that they wanted to do. That's the engine that we help drive. Not only us, others in the open source space also do the same kind of economic uh, generation in terms of creating opportunities for others. So open source software has helped that happen. If it was not for that, Red Hat as an organization, the Fedora community as an, as an entity will not exist. 
So there is significant amount of economic activity that happens just because of this notion of shareable code. Now, what we need is to also, once we recognize that there's a lot of stuff out there, there is actually a need to have some way to objectively, consistently, and repeatably get metrics about software or open source projects. And, and the stuff that are underlined in red, highlighted in red, there's a specific reason for these. They must be objective measurable. So for example, if I were to say that my blood pressure is 80 over 120, everybody understands that. We know that. We know exactly what that means. It's consistent. It's understood. In the software world, unfortunately, we don't have anything. We have various academic exercises out there. There are a lot of academic papers that have been written in terms of how do I define how much does it cost to write software? You know, there is a phrase, uh, so many lines of code cost X dollars to, to, to create. Now, these are all metrics that had to be derived from an academic perspective. But does it apply into real life projects? Sometimes it does, sometimes it does not. But today, we have a wonderful opportunity to really honestly meter a lot of these potential data sources and derive some inputs from it, some understanding of it. So objective here means if I'm going to measure lines of code or am I going to measure bug fixes, these are objective information that nobody can dispute. If you got 10 lines of code, you got 10 lines of code. That's it. If you got 50 bugs, you got 50 bugs. No disputes there. If you, if you fix 49 of the 50 bugs, you fixed 49 of the 50 bugs. That's what it is. No, it, it's, a, it's a truism that you can't deny. And so that being, that being what it is, now I have a common language for everybody to agree upon because it's, it's an obvious thing, right? So objective, consistent. I should be able to go and look at information on a regular basis. Again, going back to how we, you know, from a health perspective, what do we need to do? We need to figure out, is your heartbeat okay? When you run, you, all of those, all of you who have a, a little uh, uh, a wearable that, you know, detects your number of steps you take or how many heartbeats you, 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 you have on a, you know, when you're running or walking up the steps, these are uh, consistent information that you can collect and then you make some analysis of it at some later time. It should also be repeatable. In other words, if I'm going to be walking up a pair of steps, a, a, a staircase, and my heart rate goes up, now, if I do this an hour later, if it's the same kind of increase in heart rate, probably it's, it's consistent. Now, if suddenly the second time I go up, my heart rate just goes way off, oops, something else is happening. That means it's probably suggesting that I, might, I may be having a heart issue. I don't know. But the thing is, now I have an opportunity to measure, all right? So we want to have abilities to collect all these kinds of data so that we can then assess different projects for whether they are successful, for some definition of success. Some people may say, oh, this particular, for example, if I were to just throw a question to you, this is a Fedora user conference, right? Do you think the Fedora project is successful? I bet you, if we have about 100 people here, I probably will have 100 different variations to the answer, yes or maybe. And everybody's yes and everybody's maybe is going to be very different. Because each of you is seeing and understanding that question based on your personal experience. That's not enough. We need to have a way to make sure that this is indeed non-disputable factual analysis. Okay, So it, success has to mean something, has to be repeatable, has to be measurable. Again, it goes by definition, right? It has to be, what's the sustainability of a project? The Fedora project, is it sustainable? Is the Linux project sustainable, for that matter? Uh, I think recently Linus was interviewed, right? And um, the question posed was, if he's not doing any Linux coding anymore, if he decides to take the spacecraft and go to Mars, he can't do a summit, 
he can't do a git uh, uh, push or whatever it is, will the project continue? Is it sustainable? Perhaps, perhaps not. We don't know until it happens. But there could be certain indicators, historically speaking, with projects that had something similar. And maybe you can anticipate all of those things. I don't know. These are, but these are things that we, we need to find out. We need to experience. We need to measure and get some uh, uh, information about. The last point there is about vibrancy. Is a particular project vibrant? That means, what, what does vibrancy mean? Uh, are there a lot of uh, tweets going out? Are there a lot of uh, events happening? Are there conferences happening? Are there blog posts happening? Are there IRC conversations happening? What's happening? What's happening about the project? Is it fun? Are people having fun in this particular project? How do I measure these things? Now, the, let me give you some thinking uh, points, the uh, bullets that really, you know, was gnawing at me. Like I said, I've been with Red Hat, you know, almost 13 years. From the very beginning, this has one of, one of, been my, one of my pain points is, how would I know what is happening with an open source project? How can I find out? So, many points. I, I want to list out a, a, a fair amount of them because I think it's important that you, you hear it from me and why we are doing what we are doing. There are tens of thousands of active projects. Okay. Um, numerous projects have dominant players. Okay, I list a few. Dominant player means it could be an individual that is dominating that project. Now, dominant here doesn't mean bad or good. Okay, it's just that this is the most prolific dominant contributor in a particular project. So, the Linux kernel, is Linus the most dominant player? No, he's not. Isn't that amazing that when you tell people that, they say, why is he not? Shouldn't he be? But then the question you have to pose back is, does it have to be? So, so it is actually, you know, these are, these are nuances that people don't immediately appreciate. For example, if it is a project that has got a corporate backing to it. Say, for example, let's pick a Kubernetes as an example. Now, Kubernetes was an, was an internal project to, uh, to Google. And Google open sourced it about, what, a year and a half ago or two years ago, perhaps. Now, if you see that majority of the contributors to Kubernetes happen to be contributing via an email address that has got at google.com, let's say more than 50%. Now, is it still a community-driven project or is it a an organization-led project? Not that one is good or one is bad. It's a question to ask. Which one is it? Does it matter? Now, how many of you even know these things, right? Because if you don't think about some of these issues, it, 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 it's, it goes past you and you, you know, it never occurred to you to ask that question. So, the Linux kernel, Perl, Python, MariaDB, Hadoop, Apache, OpenStack, Docker, I just list a few, some of the newer ones as well. What does that mean if there is a dominant contributor? Is the dominant contributor a positive contributor or a negative contributor? You can now decide if based on your, your personal opinion, whether that's okay or not okay. Now, others may not agree with you, but at least that you are now agreeing to disagree or agreeing to agree on a common point of data, which is measured objectively. Otherwise, it's just he said, she said, no, I don't agree with you. You have wrong data. And the other guy says, no, I don't agree with you because you got different data. So now we are looking at one common data to figure out what does that mean. Not all projects evolve equally and consistently. Now, this is something not everybody appreciates as well. Some projects are just rapidly innovating. Some projects, for example, how many of you know of OpenSSL? I hope some of you know. Yeah, okay, come on. There must be some more hands. I know it's five o'clock, but still, all right, we, you know, yes, yeah, stretch it out. Yes, all right, there you go. Ah, not so much better. Now both hands, yeah, good. All right, this SSL 2.0, right? Okay, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> so, now, SSL, open SSL, is that a project 
that is bad, good, struggling, moving along just fine, what is it? Do you know? Some of us know. Most of us don't care. But can we have a way to find out objectively, not occasionally going to an open SSL page and say, hmm, looks everything's all right, fine, I move on. No, it cannot be that. I can't just send a photo of me to the doctor and say, hey doc, can you tell me if I'm looking okay? No, he's not going to say that. He said, look, I need your measurements, I need your blood pressure, I need all these things. A photo is not going to tell me. So you can't just send a website and say, oh, the website looks fine, so open SSL must be okay. It's not going to work that way. You need more objective data. Other issues. Open source projects vary greatly in strength, in significance, vibrancy, and influence. Strength. How many people taking part in this project? When I say taking part, doesn't mean about code contribution per se. It could be, how many people get onto the IRC chats on a regular basis? You've got nothing else to do. <laughs> but thank you for getting onto IRC chats. So, if you see the names popping up every now and then, or you know, you can see, look, there is some chat going on. I'm not trying to figure out what is being said, who is saying what. It doesn't matter. The fact that somebody is there, somebody showed up, something is happening. I'm not doing the social analysis to figure out, you know, that guy, the way he writes answers is pretty rude. So maybe I need to kick him off. I'm not going to care about those. It's irrelevant. That's irrelevant for what I need to do. I need to know that, hey, they do have a communication channel and periodically they do come together and the channel happens to be an IRC channel and they occasionally have a meat bot running and therefore I can count how many uh, lines of, uh, uh, how, how, much, how much conversation happens in the, during official meetings. Some, some, sorry, some uh, IRCs have no meat bot, so you have no idea how many lines, how much conversation happens. People come in and go out, they get kicked off, the next changes. How am I supposed to track? How do I know that when you see Harish on an IRC channel, that it is indeed me and not some one of the you know, 10 million other Harishes out there? How would you know? The question also is, do you care? Certain type of data doesn't really matter whose it is. What you need is it gives you a, a, a gloss. Okay, this is what, yeah, there is some chatter happening. There's something going on. We are not the NSA. So, but we want to know something is happening. Noise. Noise is a useful thing in certain situations. But in this case, noise can obscure problems. There could be a lot of people complaining about something when whatever they're complaining about is really not the issue. There is some other underlying factor that needs to be addressed. And sometimes this can also suggest the flip side, which is silence. It means there's no complaint, nothing's happening. Can also cloak success. So open SSL, to pick the example I mentioned earlier, I think open SSL is a very successful project. Yes, true, they had a issue recently, but otherwise it's a very successful project. A successful project in this particular case is in cruise control right now. It's at 10,000 meters, it's on autopilot and off you go. Occasionally, yes, there's a bit of a bump in the road. Yeah, they found a bug and he got it fixed and turns out the guy has been doing this in his spare time. Not a good idea. So let's give him some money. And Linux Foundation stepped up to it. Others put some money into it. And he's paid now. Great. So we solved part of the problem. The same thing happens in many other spaces as well. So silence can cloak success. There is no simple way to evaluate or compare projects objectively in today's context. There isn't a simple way. There, there are many attempts out there. I'm not saying that there aren't. There are many people trying to do something. But it is not an easy thing to, to, to do. And this is one of the things that myself and some colleagues of mine have been looking within Red Hat to figure out what it is that we can do so the greater community can also benefit from it uh, in the long term. There is, apart from the fact that you, know, you may choose a project because you like it or because you're using it. There could be the small risk. And, you know, in reality, it's not a big risk, but there could be a risk 
of committing to a declining project. Like people are saying, you know what, I don't want to do anything at all with 32-bit systems. But hey, you love 32-bit systems and you're going to contribute a, a bunch of things to it. Fine, but it's declining. So don't cry when the last 32-bit system is switched off in 2038 or somewhere there because it's not going to run anymore. But at least you know it's, going, it's there in the horizon and you don't care what happens in 2038 because you probably have moved on to something else. But at least you know something ahead of time. And also you're not missing on something that's thriving. <clears throat> this seems a bit of a oxymoron, right? Open source projects are not always openly trackable. Now, let me do a quick survey. How many of you first have heard of Bitcoin? Okay. How many of you have Bitcoins in your Bitcoin wallet right now? Okay, great. Can we do some exchange later? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I need some Bitcoins. Uh, question to you. What is your understanding of Bitcoin as a project? Is it an open source project? Anybody? Yes, no, maybe, yes. It is an open source project from the point of view that the code is available. But have you ever heard of bugs in the Bitcoin code? Have you heard of any um, security vulnerabilities in the code? Why? Why? The answers have been no, no. I, for those of you far behind can't hear. The answers to both the questions are no. Now, is that therefore a healthy project? That's my question to you. Would you consider Bitcoin, hey, we are going to do financial transactions, you know, the three or four of us with Bitcoin wallets here and Bitcoins, we're going to do financial transactions and we have no idea about the quality of the code. We have no idea. There isn't a Bugzilla tracker on, on Bitcoin. I didn't know that until I started tracking. It's like, oh, no kidding. They don't have anything. There are no CVEs. Now, that was quite, quite an eye-opener for me. It's like, whoa, man, this is... But people think, oh, it's an open source project, so therefore it's okay. It's great. You know, people, the community will fix it. Yes, the community will fix it, but nobody knows that you're fixing it. And that is a problem. That is really a problem. So what do I need? I need a tool that offers a simple, coherent way to assess, uh, uh, to, to access and track continuously. It cannot be a one-off kind of thing. It has to be a continuous tracking. Every day, I need to be able to know. It's just like those of us who are wearing, you know, wearables to track our how many steps you take and how many. Uh, you know, how many times you sat down, how long you sat down, how long you stood up, and, and so on and so forth. It's a continuous measurement that's happening. Can I do the same thing for open source projects? Now, hasn't this been done before? There, there are. There are uh, people who have done parts, uh, maybe, you know, quite a big chunk of it. Uh, how many of you have heard of openhub.net? Okay, quite a few. It used to be called something else. Anybody know? It was called Olo. Olo.net. O-H-L-O-H.net. They got renamed as OpenHub.net. Uh, Olo got bought by Black Duck. Um, and um, sometime later, they renamed it. Now, Olo, uh, sorry, OpenHub has got thousands, I think 60,000 projects being, uh, uh, you know, added to their repository. Now, one of the challenges I find with uh, Olo, uh, I'm sorry, well, OpenHub, is um, I don't have a way to pull in the Olo itself or OpenHub itself and run on my own infrastructure. In other words, it's not an open source project. They are helping you put your information about the projects you are interested in and give you, you know, stickers and you give you a thumbs up and, um, you know, nice credentials here and there. And I mean, it's, they do good stuff. I'm not uh, dishing any of it. I think that's wonderful that they're doing it. But I needed more than what they were offering. 
there's another organization called Bitergia, uh, which also does, you know, a very good work. Um, they do have a, a set of tools, which is, uh, you know, GPL and open source, um, um, and it does the job that it's supposed to do and does it extremely well. But I needed more than what that particular tool was offering. In fact, if you use, uh, if you go to uh, uh, OpenStack dot uh, com, is, uh, is it OpenStack dot com? Um, I, I, I forget which one it is right now. Um, you should be able to look at Bitergia's analysis of the code that is being submitted into the OpenStack uh, repositories, which is very useful. But I needed more than that. Okay. There's another uh, project called openhatch.org, which is really not a, a what I was looking for, but this is a, a an interesting uh, uh, project site where people can, you know, try and find others to work together and so on. So this this is anybody here has a doing some stuff on open open hatch? No, nobody at all. Okay, but you know, so what I'm trying to say is there are others who are doing sort of similar things. It's just like. Um, you know, the, the, the old fable where there are four blind men and an elephant and you're getting the four blind men to describe what the elephant is. One guy holds the tail and says, no, this is very long and uh, hairy and stuff. And the other guy holds the leg and says, no, it's round and fat and thick. And the third one holds the trunk and says, no, this is very curvy and all that. And the last one holds the ear and says, oh, this is a very big flappy kind of thing. So you got four descriptions of the animal called the elephant. So the same thing happens when you have no, the way I look at it, a consistent way to look at projects. So each of these that I mentioned before, um, Open, uh, Open Hub, Bitergia, and uh, Open Hatch, they, there's a large overlap. At the same time, there are things that they don't do consistently across different projects. It's not their fault. They come from a very different uh, perspective. And of course, there are many more. There are, there are very, very more. So, so yeah, but what do you want to do about it? So I have to give my obligatory XKCD uh, you know, cartoon. It's about standards, right? So those of you who can't read at the back, let me try and read it to you. The left slide says, uh, how, well, the, the title is How Standards Proliferate. The left one is a situation. There are 14 competing standards. The central tile says 14 is ridiculous. We need to develop one universal standard that covers everybody's use cases. And she agrees. And then soon you have a situation where there are 15 competing standards. So for everybody, there is one new standard available. So pick a standard. If you don't like it, make a new one and then you like it. Right? So in theory, that's sort of what is happening here as well. But in spite of KCD's wisdom, okay, I went ahead and started a project to create a tool. Um, the objective is also to make sure that this tool is then available to not only within Red Hat, but also to the entire free and open source community. And I would like to introduce something called Open Source Prospector. That's the name of this project that we have been working on. Um, short form, Prospector. Open Source Prospector is, is, is a bus. There's too many, too many letters inside, too many syllables. So Prospector is all, all I'm going to talk about. Um, let me just show you a screenshot. Uh, the reason I want to show you a screenshot is in case the internet fails. So this is about the only thing I can show you because it's, if, if, if it fails, I will do a demo right now, but if it fails, this is what you have to see. So all you can see, you know, it's kind of pretty bad from the back there. Uh, this is a, this is a, a, a page that lists uh, currently I'm tracking about 180 projects, or 181 projects. And I, I am able to look at the projects from a whole set of different metrics. Okay, so let me go live now. Let me see whether the demo gods are... Okay. Sure, I can run through the page. Now, this is the, what I'm, uh, it's called the land, uh, well, landing page, yeah. Okay. No, this is a screenshot. I have, I have the web page. Let me just do that. Let me 
I had to bring it across. Hang on. Do this first. Okay. All right, it's a bit uh, as big as I think I can possibly project on this. So here I'm showing uh, the Wi-Fi seems to be fine. Everything looks okay. So we are all systems go. So let me uh, back this up. Okay, as you can see, the I have in this case one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns. The leftmost column is called project name, the name of the project. And then I have a bunch of uh, four columns here, which has got five minutes left. Yes, that's not part of what I was going to say. I was just reminding myself. <laughs> uh, so I got four columns that is showing some color-coded barcodes, uh, uh, color-coded bars. The idea behind the color is to indicate from my perspective, my perspective meaning the developer's perspective, whether a particular characteristic, in this case, infrastructure, is it green? That means it's okay. It can be yellow. That means it's, yeah, it's borderline. Or it could be red, which means, hey, there's something not quite right here. So it's a very quick visual clue and it's consistently applied to all this set of metrics. So activity, code quality, publicity, and then two other columns, when was the project started? When was the last activity that has been picked up from us, from this, uh, from Prospector? When did Prospector last see it? Now, what happens in this, this particular last column is a bit tricky because we have to run the code to go and pull the data in. So it's whenever the code was run. Now, if when you run, when the, the code is run and it pulls in, there was no change from the last time, that means there's no change. So it stays in the last, uh, the last run. And the last column is, you can see a bunch of compare buttons. The intention behind this is I want to be able to compare. Remember one of the things I mentioned earlier was I would like to have a high level view of different projects looking at the same metrics. It's just like I have a high level view of all of your medical records right in front of me. And one glance I can say, who has got dietary problems? Who has got health issues? Who's got high blood pressure? One glance. Everybody. So that's, that's the idea behind this. So let me down, uh, let's assume the demo gods are fine and my connection is up. Let me just uh, pick one of them. Okay, I'll just pick the first one, active and queue. Uh, maybe I'll just scroll down. Uh, stop, tell me when to stop. I'm going to the last one. Let me see what I have. Um, anybody want to look at yum? Okay, let's look at yum then. That's a, 181 projects is what I have right now. So I'm going to click on yum. So <clears throat> the data that we have was from the is effectively the start of the project till 23rd. Oh, that's very recent. So it was run about two days, three days ago. And then it lists out what is the name of the project and a whole bunch of what I say, what I would call clinical, uh, you know, information that you must have. For example, do you have, does this project have a web page? In today's context, if your project has no web page, wherever the page may be, how are people going to find out? As far as I'm concerned, at that point, it's a fail because I have no idea how to get to your project. No idea. Second, date started. Uh, what is the latest version, uh, no, versions available? Uh, what license is it being put under? Is it under GNU public license? Is it under MSD, uh, BSD license, MIT license? What, uh, what license is it? We are not making any value judgment about which license, as long as it's an open source license. Uh, does it have a contributor licensing agreement? One of the things that we prefer, we as in Rehab prefers, that we don't have something like that, right? Uh, is there a governance model around it? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Is it good or bad? You, if you are interested in contributing to YUM, 
you have an opportunity to understand and make something to, with it. I know I'm going to have zero minutes left, yes. Uh, so let me then go on to the next one, infrastructure. So each of these have different characters. Does it have a website? Yes. So you get one point. And so as you can see, a lot of the uh, statements above have been checked off with information regarding yes, no. It's a yes, no. Does it have or does not have? And then we go down to look at activity. Now this is where it becomes interesting. So let's look at commit activities. So it lists out from the inception of this particular project up until the last time this was run, um, how many commits per month. Um, we have a bunch of metrics that you can then look at and say, all right, in May, in August 2012, there were commits. As you can see here, there's a red, uh, red colored portion of the graph and a, what's the other color? Is it yellow? Is it orange? Is something. Um, the non, the non red color. Um, what that means is the red color essentially says this was a commit that was done by somebody who's, who used an email address at redhead.com. So straight away, I will know, oh, you know what? This particular project had a lot of activity in the 2007 timeframe. And subsequently, the activity from Red Hat contributors have gone down. Now, is it good or bad? That's up to you to decide. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm just showing you the data. Now you infer, does it make sense to you? I can see why it, it may have declined because we have now moved on to another packaging model, right? Uh, uh, a DNF. So could it be that because of that, contributors from Red Hat has declined? So this is a clear indication. If you are interested in contributing to Yum, sure, you can go and do this. But you do know that you know there is a, de a declining contribution happening from certain uh, uh, contributors. Maybe that's fine. It's okay because that's the way projects evolve. It's Darwinian principles working beautifully in right in front of you. Okay, um, you can look at how many. Uh, let's look at some other stuff here. Let's say uh, bug report. So there were a lot of bug reports that were filed. Many of them from Red Hat, and a lot of them not from non-Red Hatters, which is great. How many of them were closed? Um, and who were the reporters? How, who were the reporters? How many of them were actual Red Hatters reporting it? And how many were non-Red Hatters reporting? So that's when, yes, yeah, zero minutes. So I've got to wrap it up. All right, I get it. I get it. Someone pulled the plug. So I just wanted to show this demo, okay? Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you more because time is up. So I got my excuse. <laughs> So let me just quickly go the, to that screenshot. All right, so open source prospector or prospector in short is based on Python. We built it on Python using Django as the uh, framework and it's sitting on an OpenShift instance currently internal to Red Hat. The whole idea here is to make this in one switch, you know, to flip it and make it available for the rest of the planet. For all of you, so that you can, the intention really is to make this better and more useful for all projects out there, as many as we possibly can. Um, comments and questions? I know I'm completely out of time. I'm borrowing time from, uh, yes, questions? Yes, I have a question at the back there. You may, right at the back. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, how does how do you get all this data which you are showing? I think uh, some of it can be crawled from Git, uh, like who is committing and uh, what is in the yeah. address. So, but yeah. uh, things like uh, does it have a blog? Does it have a project web page? I think uh, the the spec file has a URL field, but what about the blog and IRC channels and mailing lists? Yeah. So the the way we are doing this is first the data that we want to collect. We are collecting about forty one different metrics blogs, uh, commits to, you know, wherever you're committing to, whether it's Jira or, 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 or you know, bug reports, uh, whether you put it on GitHub, I don't care where you do it. We have discovered a few interesting problems. 
First problem, when we want to look at committers based on organization or who is the biggest committer for a particular project, if that project happens to be parked under Apache, guess what happens? Every committer's email address is at apache.org. So I have no way to know. So if you look at any of the Apache projects, every project is apache.org. It's 100%. Wow. So, so I mean, I didn't, I didn't realize that part. So, so therefore, that particular metric, if you're going to base any decisions or, or actions based on that kind of metric, it's useless because you don't know who they are. I mean, who they really are representing. It may be unimportant to you or it may be important to you, but that's a constraint that we discovered. Which was, I, I didn't even, I mean, I probably knew about it, but it didn't occur to me that, hey, the Apache does it this way. And that it's not wrong. It just happens that way. Is it good? Is it bad? For what we wanted to do, it turns out to be hey, not so not so good because it fails our one of our tests. I don't think it looks good that only one organization is uh, is is providing that. But we do know that they are an open source organization from that point of view, and so therefore it's probably a good thing. Um, so, but that, so you have to infer that kind of information. Some projects we have a lot of people with at gmail.com, and gmail.com happens to be the number one uh, contributor. Really, because they are not using any other email address, so that's fine. So we need to we need to figure out how do how do I discount something like that? People who use that kind of addresses, does it matter if I discount or should I just say so be it? That's what it is, right? That's the reality. I hope that I kind of answered your question. And we have forty one different metrics that we are measuring. Every single metric has to be publicly reachable, and we then pull it in. So we have been banned from some sites because we're pulling in too much information. Uh, one of the, again, we had one small problem with, uh, uh, I think it was a Gmail or something, and we had some issues with getting some of the uh, blog posts, uh, mailing list contributions, and so on. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, do you plan to, uh, do you plan to extend it only for, uh, I mean, uh, do you want to only focus on projects that are, uh, on which Red Hat focuses, or do you want to? Or do, would you extend it to other uh, organizations also? For example, commits made by employers of Collabora or any other organization, or is it just about Red Hat employers and? Red okay, or? like I said, the intention is not about Red Hat itself. It's not. I, I initial objective was to create a tool first, and then try and figure out. So you can. In, this is fully customizable. You can choose what is it that you want to know. I want to now search on just. Uh, let me just see if I can pull something here. Uh, where am I? Where's my mouse? Okay. Uh, let's look at. Um, so here I'm looking at activity for bug reports for Yum, and it says that the top email addresses with domains uh, being repo uh, 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 domains reporting bugs is at rayhead.com as 181 uh, 1,821 reporting from 274 at rehead.com addresses. So you can just go down the list and see who else is com committing. There are 814 addresses that we have picked up. Okay, domains we have picked up. And let's look at all the way right down to the one guy who did the one bug report. Thank you very much. Right, where's the last guy? Come on. Uh, it's going all the way down. Uh, it's 800 plus. Uh, come on. Oh, I just passed it. Okay, the last guy, IRS. Wow. That's nice. IRS.gov has got one bug report. That's the last one to get in. Imagine that. I, <laughs> I'm actually surprised to see this myself. I couldn't even have made this up, even if it was, even if I wanted to make it up. This is real data, right? The US IRS has filed a bug report on Yum. How about that? <laughs> Thank you very much, IRS. <laughs> so I hope that answered your question. So the data is there. It's a matter how you want to, you know, slice and dice it. Yes, another question here. Okay, I, it is an embarrassing question for me to answer. Um, I, I unfortunately don't have a timeline, but it will happen and it will happen soon. I don't have a timeline. Okay. Any other questions? All right, so if there are no questions, so this, these are places where, whoops, wrong place. This is how you can get to me. And uh, my Twitter handle is Harish Pillay. And so thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I hand you over to Kushal. Thank you.